So I want to um, start off today with a little show and tell kind of time. I don't know if any of you guys did this uh, when you were kids in school, show and tell. Right? I have something I want to show you this morning, um, and some of you will know what this is. Uh, some of you may not have ever seen one of these before. Actually, my kids who were here earlier, um, they have seen them, but they have never seen one in use before. So if you see this and know what it is, just say it out, okay? Anybody know what this is right here? A <laughs> big map, that's right. Yeah, this is um, a map of the state of Colorado. It was made in 1999. Um, it tells you in there that Bill Owens was the governor then. This is long before my time in Colorado, right? Um, but this is one of those things that this is the way you used to get around. You open this up and half the trick of life is being able to figure out how to put it back together without <laughs> losing your mind, right? I don't do that very well, so I'm not going to open it all the way up. But this is the way we got around, right? This is the way you went places is through a map like this. If you open this up and look at it, it has Wellington on the map. Um, I hope you don't want to go anywhere in Wellington because there is nothing to tell you about roads in Wellington, but it shows you we are close to I-25 on here. Um, some of you may be surprised to find out that there was a period of my life where I kind of lived by these things. I was actually a traveling salesman and figured out really quickly that I was better at talking people out of buying things than talking people into buying things, and I was going broke really fast, right, and a 100% commission kind of deal. But what I would do is I would wake up, and I was I had a huge territory, so I would drive, you know, 200 miles to get to the city I was going to be in for the day the whole morning drive and get there, um, set up the appointments in advance and all of that. But I would get into town and many times I would get to the town through something like this or you may remember the ancient technology of MapQuest. I'm sure they've you know, come along since then. But I would print out something from MapQuest showing me the exact location. Half the time I would get to the town, I would drive around, I could not find it based on the map of MapQuest. And so I would have to stop at a gas station. Hey, did you ever go down this particular street? Have you ever heard of this? Well, how do I get there, right? Or I would have to call the person I was trying to see and say, I'm in your town. I just have no idea how to get to your house. Right? That was the best technology we had at the time, back before cell phones and before GPS and before all of that. Today, as you guys know, you just plug it in. You plug in the address and you don't even have to think about it again. Right? You put your phone down and it just tells you, hey, 200 feet, you're going to have to turn left. And, you know, two miles, you're going to take this exit. And, and you just follow whatever steps it tells you. And like 98% of the time, you actually end up where you're supposed to be. Right? Occasionally, you have that, you have arrived and you're in the middle of nowhere. It's like, this is not good. But most of the time. Right? Most of the time, the technology has improved to such a point that you actually end up where you're supposed to be. Just a, a fun trivia kind of fact for you guys. Anybody know why GPS was created? Uh, we've got a lot to learn about GPS because this is a series that we're calling GPS. Right? The whole reason GPS was created was to track our enemies. Right? So back during the Cold War, um, there, there were times where you know, we put satellites up in space and we were trying to track people. We figured out we could track based on radio frequencies and stuff. We were tracking our enemies, seeing what they were doing. So let's think about what that means for the fact that you're being tracked everywhere you go on your phone now. Uh, the, the whole idea, though, is that over the next several weeks, we are going to be talking about the idea of GPS. And, and here's the big question. Here's the one big thing that we're going to be asking over and over and over again, all right? Here it is. You're going to end up somewhere in life. Why not be intentional about it? it this applies in so many different ways. And, and actually, we're, we're going to use this over several summers um, because this is just kind of a summer theme. A lot of us are traveling. Maybe it's, you know, going on vacation, going to see family, um, going on traveling baseball team, whatever it is. But there are a lot of people traveling. And so throughout the summer, um, at least the next seven weeks, we're going to be looking at this idea of we're going somewhere. Why not be intentional about where we're going in life? This summer particularly, we are looking at the idea of being intentional in relationships. So again, the idea is 
you're going to end up somewhere in the relationships that you have. And, and those that you're working with and those that are neighbors to you with your spouse and with your kids, you're going to end up somewhere. Why not be intentional about where you're going and how you're going to end up in that place? That's the big question. So really, we're kind of backing up and asking this question and saying, what would happen if we went into relationships saying, I'm thinking about the end of the relationship rather than just thinking about the immediate in the relationship. Let's be honest, that's the way that we do relationships most of the time, right? We, we think about it in the immediate. What do I need right now? That's why I'm interacting with this person. What do I need to convey to them right now? It's typically about right now. This is what I need right now. That's the way we do relationships. But what we're doing is we're looking at Scripture and seeing what Scripture says. In order to have healthy relationships in the long run, in the long term, what do we need to do? How do we need to be intentional up front? Uh, today, in order to do that, we're going to look at a story of a relationship in Scripture that's really a unique thing. I, I don't know of any other story like this um, in, in many places. In fact, um, there are couple of similarities in other stories in Scripture, but this is a unique relationship that we're going to be looking at today, and it's found in the book of Acts. So if you haven't been there in a while and want to open into your Bibles, it is uh, that's in the New Testament. <laughs> Go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. We'll be in Acts chapter 20, um, and what the speaker is doing that is going to start us off here is he is saying... Now, he, he's really using some kind of race terminology, and he's saying, I want to finish well. I want to cross the finish line with integrity and do this as well as I can. So if you see where we're going here, he's saying exactly what we're talking about. He's saying, I want to look at the end and make sure that I'm getting there in the right way. And so basically, he's going to say, in order to get there, I think there's one thing that you need to focus on in your relationships to do them well. So Acts chapter 20, we'll start in verse 24, and uh, we'll, we'll move through the chapter as we go this morning. So Acts 20, verse 24 says this, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If you were to stop right there, this would be a really awkward thing, right? If, if you just stop where the guy says, I kind of feel worthless. Um, you might think, oh, there's no reason I should take advice from you. But really what he is doing is, and this is just the first part of the sentence, right? What he's saying is he's saying, if I don't get this one thing right, if I don't do this well in my relationships, everything else is worthless. I have missed the point entirely if I don't start my relationships in this manner. So here's the one big thing he says. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. If you're anything like me, you might say, I don't really get it. <laughs> you know, what's the big relational thing here that he's talking about? I mean, he's talking about testifying to the gospel of God's grace, and that sounds really churchy and sounds really good, but honestly, what is he talking about? What does that mean? So let's just break it down for a second, okay? As he talks about the gospel of God's grace, if you want to take out the, the church language entirely, um, basically what he's saying here is he is talking about the good news of God's generosity to us. Think about this. What is grace? Grace is any time that we receive something that we don't deserve. Anytime God gives us love and forgiveness that we did not deserve, that we did not earn, that is grace, right? That is the generosity of God on display. And so essentially what the writer's saying here is he's saying, this is where I want to start relationships. This is the foundation I want to begin them on. I want to begin all of my relationships on the good news of God's generosity to me. That, that may still feel really weird. And you might say that's a great thing for a guy in the Bible to do with his life, but I don't know how that applies. This is very practical advice, though, and I think you will see that as we look at the context of what's going on. I want to back up and just tell you the story here because this is where it gets really cool. This is where it matters. 
So does anybody know, maybe you read ahead just a little bit, does anybody know who this is that's speaking in this passage? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Paul, right, the Apostle Paul is speaking here. And he is speaking to a group of people that literally may have been his best friends in the world. Uh, these are people that were leaders in the church in Ephesus that he's speaking to. And as he's speaking to them, um, he is sharing with them some pretty incredible stuff. What he is telling them, you'll see this in just a second, but he's telling them, this is the last time I'm ever going to see you. So take these words seriously. And, and we'll, we'll look at that in just a second. But think about this. He's been with these people in Ephesus for three and a half years. This is a guy who was a missionary, who traveled, who went all over the place starting all kind of churches. Didn't stay in places very long. But in Ephesus, he stayed there three and a half years. I don't know how long it takes you to develop a friendship. <laughs> if it takes more than three and a half years, we might need to have a talk, though, right? <laughs> Usually friendships happen kind of quickly, and then they develop or they dwindle one way or the other, right? But in three and a half years, you can develop some really significant friendships. If you think back to high school, if you went through the same high school all four years, uh, chances are you developed some close relationships during that time. Um, you may be thinking, I just don't even want to think about high school, you know, and so I can't remember back to that kind of thing. But three and a half years is plenty of time to develop deep, lasting relationships. For me, I moved to Wellington, our family moved to Wellington three and a half years ago, almost exactly. Uh, and, and I look at you guys, and you guys are some of the closest people in the world to me, you know? I look at you and I think of you as friends. I think of you as being people that I cherish and I trust. And, and so I can say from experience, you can develop some really solid relationships in three and a half years. Chances are, like I said, these are Paul's closest friends in the entire world. And what he's doing is he has been at Ephesus. Now he's leaving. Um, he went on some other missionary journey trip kind of things for a couple of months. And he's headed back to Jerusalem. I have a map that I want to show you just to kind of get this in your head. Um, this is a map of over here is Israel. Jerusalem is down here. Modern day Turkey. And right under the word Turkey, you can see that's where Ephesus is. That's where Paul had been hanging out. Well, what he's doing, like I said, is he has left Ephesus. He went to Athens and Corinth. He's trying to get back to Jerusalem. And there's basically a bounty on this guy's head. Um, people want him dead. They don't like Paul. And because of that, he cannot go directly back into Ephesus. So he contacts the leaders of this church and says, meet me in Miletus, which is a town that's about 50 miles south of there. Because I've got some things I want to tell you. And like I mentioned, he, he comes to them and he tells them, I'm not going to see you again. This is it for us. For, for some people in our lives, maybe some of those people you were in high school with, you, you hear this is it for us, and you think, oh, okay, not a big deal, right? Um, maybe a good thing. I'm glad we're having this conversation. For other people, it's like I'm close to you. I've got an acquaintance. Um, but, you know, I'm going to be sad when we leave, but it's not tearing my heart out. Uh, but for some people, we get close to them, and there's just this, I can't imagine doing life apart. That's the conversation that Paul was about to have with these guys, that I can't imagine what life is going to be like if we're not doing life together. And, and he knows he's not coming back, so he even tells them that. In verses 22 and 23, if we back up just a little bit, this is what Paul said. He said, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. Not knowing what will happen to me there, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing. So he says, everywhere I go, whether it's prophets that are telling him this, whether it's dreams, whether it's circumstances, whatever it is, he says, everywhere I go, the same thing keeps being told to me. I'm about to go to prison. I'm about to go to jail, and I'm probably not getting out. And, and sure enough, he would go to Jerusalem. There's a prison or a, a temple riot that happens. They blame it on Paul, even though he didn't do anything. He gets thrown in prison. 
For two years, he's in prison at Caesarea, and then he gets sent to Rome, where we believe he spent pretty much the rest of his life under either house arrest or imprisonment to some degree, right? And so he's never going to see these people again. He's meeting with his best friends in the world, and he's saying, if you didn't learn anything else from me about relationships, I want you to get this one thing. I want you to understand that the way I do relationships, Paul is saying, is I make sure with everyone that I'm building relationships with that I build it on the foundation of the grace of God. In other words, because God is so good to me and so generous toward me, I want to be that same way toward the people that I'm connecting with, that I build relationships with. And he tells these guys, hey, there's going to be some... People coming into your church in Ephesus that aren't good people, don't pay attention to them. So he gives some kind of instructions for the church. And then in verse 32, he jumps back to this personal conversation. So he says this in verse 32. He says, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Again, there are a lot of churchy biblical words in there, right? Sanctified and the word of grace. And what what is he really trying to say here? If you just look at it in context, what he's saying is he's saying, I'm not going to be your leader anymore. I'm not going to be the pastor of this church. I'm not going to be around. You're not under my authority anymore. So he's saying, I commit you to God. God is your leader. You just follow him. And then secondly, he says, and I commit you to the gospel of God's grace, the word of grace. He comes back to that idea, right? So earlier he said, here's the way I do relationships. I do relationships by saying, I want to imitate the generosity of God. He says, now that is your mission. I'm not going to be here. This is the way that you do relationships. You imitate the generosity of God to the people around you. By the way, maybe it doesn't even need to be said, but when we talk about generosity, a lot of times the big thing that comes to mind is what? Money, right? (laughs) But is that the only way that God is generous or gracious toward us? No. In fact, that's probably the most minor of the ways that he is generous toward us. He, He is generous for us. He provides for us in that way. But... His grace, his generosity is seen every single day in the way that he pours out his love on us that we don't deserve. He pours out his forgiveness on us that we have not earned, right? And so I think what Paul is saying here is he's saying this is a generosity deal. We're imitating generosity of God. He's not just saying that, oh, it's all about money here. He's saying this is a whole life thing. If you want healthy relationships in all of life, you be generous to people the way that God is generous to you. He goes on in verse 33, um, and he does talk about money a little bit. But verse 33 says, I have not, so this is the way I have lived, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And then in verse 35, pay attention to this verse because this is key. This is, this is huge. He says this. In everything I did, again, he's giving the example of how to do relationships. Everything you do is generally in the context of relationship, right? In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work that we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Have you ever heard that verse before? It is more, or that quote, it is more blessed to give. To receive. You probably, you may have even said it like around Christmas when you're wanting a really nice gift. You tell somebody around you, you know, it's more blessed for you to give to me than it is for you to receive, right? Um, that's kind of the context we think of this verse in, but Paul brings it in here and he does it very intentionally. This, this is amazing to me because this is not a verse that's seen in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. This isn't a verse from the gospel. It's not, a, it's not a quote that Jesus gives that we've seen earlier. This is a new quote from Jesus in the book of Acts where Paul says, I know that this is Jesus. I know that this is what he said. Why would he introduce that quote here? 
I mean, you think about that. He, he's talking about the most important thing in terms of relationships. He could have pulled from any of the things that we have in the Gospel of Follows that Jesus said that would be huge in terms of relationships. But he pulls this quote here that, that we haven't seen before, and he says, here, here's the deal with relationships. It is more blessed to give than receive. You know why I think he does that? You know find out whether you want to or not, right? <laughs> it, it's, it's what I think. Um, I think what he's doing is he's saying, the whole reason I have lived this way, and the whole reason I'm telling you to live this way, is because Jesus lived this way. This is the model that Jesus gave us. When you engage in relationship, you do it with a heartbeat that says, I want to demonstrate to you the kind of generosity that God did. You're imitating the ways of Jesus. I believe that's what Paul is saying. He's saying the whole reason this matters, the whole reason this works is because this is what Jesus does. This is what God does. And can we just really boil it all down? I mean, really, if we're honest, if we want healthy relationships, doesn't it just make sense to imitate what Jesus did? <laughs> doesn't it just make sense to imitate what God has done? That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, you want healthy relationships? You want to do it the right way? Just do what Jesus did. And he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, or if you, you grew up around the church, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Right? Um, the last few verses here are, are really cool verses. Because this is the last part of this story. Um, and it shows you the result of what he has just been talking. He has lived in a way where with these Ephesian leaders, um, he has always lived so that he showed them, he demonstrated to them the generosity of God as he did life with them, right? So in verse 36, here's the way that we see this works. It says this, when he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced what grieved them the most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. In other words, these aren't people that after three years of spending time with Paul, they just said, oh, okay, I guess we won't see you again. Like we talked about a minute ago. These aren't people that were just acquaintances that said, no, nah, not a big deal. You know, we'll catch you on Facebook later, Paul. <laughs> um, that, that's not the way this goes. It shows... These were healthy, authentic relationships. These people wept over him when they heard, we're not going to see you again. It's just an incredible demonstration from this passage that this works. <laughs> if you want healthy relationships, maybe, maybe you should listen to the, the words of Paul and imitate the ways of Jesus in that what you do you start by saying, I am going to demonstrate the generosity of God in this relationship to my spouse. But let's be honest, do you always feel like demonstrating the generosity of God in the heat of the moment, in the heat of the argument? No. <laughs> Paul says, if you want a healthy relationship, this is what you have to build on. With your kids, when they're not paying attention or when they're talking back or when they're doing what kids do, is this the first thing that comes to mind? Generally, no. Paul says, if you really want to establish healthy relationships with your kids, this needs to be front and center in your mind. That you are showing them, demonstrating to them the generosity of God as you interact with them. You are showing them grace as you interact with them. When I was a uh, teenager, my dad became a pastor. He had actually been a insurance salesman um, for most of my life. And when he was 40 years old, he became a pastor. I was a teenager, like I said. The first church that he pastored was in New Orleans. And it was a church called Edgewater, about the size of our group here today. Um, so a fairly small church. Um, and, and the church was older. It, had, it was established. They had a building for the church, but they also had something called a parsonage. If you guys have been around churches for a while, you know that's the place the preacher lived, right? That's the, the house that the church owns, but the preacher and his family, the pastor and his family lived there. <coughs> and the parsonage was not directly on the same property as the church building. 
Uh, it was about a mile down the road. But everybody in that community knew where the preacher's house was. You know, they knew where the pastor lived. They may have never come to church before at, at Edgewater, but they knew where the preacher's house was. And in that community, there are some, uh, there, there's a, a number of people that are um, poor, to, to, to put it bluntly, right? And so there would often be times where we would get a knock on the door at 10 o'clock at night or midnight, or whatever, wake us up, you know, and my dad would go to the door, and the first question is, is this the preacher's house? Yes, this is the preacher's house, right? And, and the second question was always um, something, asking for something. So I don't have groceries, I don't have this, I don't have that, I need gas to get to this place, whatever the case may be. Um, at that time, like I said, my dad had just switched careers, um, and he was at a church that basically couldn't pay him anything. He had cashed in all of his retirement in order to go to seminary to be a pastor. So he basically didn't have anything, right? Um, but you know what he would do pretty much every time someone would come? He wouldn't just hand out cash. So, I mean, he wouldn't just, you know, give them money. But I remember time after time, 10 o'clock at night or at midnight, he would get dressed again, he would put on his clothes, he would get in his car, he would take these people to the grocery store or to the gas station and get them what they needed. And there was a point when I was a teenager when I kind of questioned that. I'm like, Dad, why don't you, you know, at least tell them to come at a decent time of day or whatever, you know. And, and really his response to me was a huge teaching moment for me. His response was essentially, as, as we talked about, you know, people taking advantage of you and all that, his response was, I would rather be generous and be taken advantage of um, than be greedy and get it wrong. And, and the more we talked about that, the more it became evident that the reason he was that way, the reason he thought that way because, was because he said, this is what God does for me. And, and so I want to do the same. I think that's really a summary of what we're saying this morning, what Paul's saying. If you want healthy relationships, I really believe he said the foundation for healthy relationships is a healthy dose of intentional generosity. If you want healthy relationships with your spouse or your coworker or your neighbor or the guy you run into at the grocery store, if you want to develop healthy relationships, you and I can't come to the point where we say, well, if you'll do this and this and this, then we'll have a good relationship. Isn't that what we typically do? If you'll fix yourself in these areas, then we can do this relationship, right? That's the way we typically think. But what God says is if we want healthy relationships, we go into the relationship saying, I am changing the way I'm thinking. And I am going to be generous in my words, I'm going to be generous in my thoughts, I'm going to be generous in my encouragement, I'm going to be generous financially if I can, because that's what God does for me. That's the foundation of all healthy relationships. Um, I want to give you a, a way to just step into this today, you know, because it's really easy to come to a service and hear some things and think, oh, that's really good information and go away and never think about it again, right? Um, throughout this series, we want to give you very practical ways that you can step into the things that we are talking about. And so today, just a really simple thing. In the seat back in front of you, there is, among other things, with the envelopes and all that, there's one of these little cards um, that just has part of one sentence on it. It just says this. The thing I desire most in my relationships with other people is, and then there's a blank there, right? Your job this week is to fill in the blank. In other words, if you look at all of your relationships, if you look at where you want to end up in the long run in your relationships, what is the thing that you need to start doing? What's the mindset shift that you need to have? in order to step into this. Maybe it's exactly what we've been talking about this morning. Maybe God gives you a different way to word that or say that on here. But I want you to take this this week and make it personal, make it yours. You write in what you need to do in order to start having healthy relationships. What is the step you need to take? What is the mindset you need to have in order to do that? All right? Um, and then next weekend, 
Come back and bring this with you. So stick it in your Bible, stick it in your purse, fold it up and put it in your wallet, whatever you need to do. Bring this back with you next weekend because we're going to reference it again next weekend. And if yours is still blank next week, we're all going to laugh at you. So don't bring it back blank, all right? Put something on it. Uh, you, 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 know, you don't get brownie points just for bringing it back. Bring it back with something on it. And start to truly ask God this week, how, how can I do this in a way that honors you and that builds strong, healthy relationships with the people around you? Here's, here's, here's the thing. We're all going to end up saying, why not be intentional about following the ways of God to get where he wants us to go? Why not be intentional about following the ways of God to end up with a healthy relationship versus a normal relationship? Let's go to heaven and ask him that.